The greatest power you possess is your ability to choose. Join Lowe's Moore as he reveals how you can begin to maximize that power by exploring yourself on the deepest levels and committing to making lasting and positive changes. Get ready to achieve breakthroughs that will lead to accelerated growth and transformation because you are now tuned in to The Blueprint. Good evening and welcome back to The Blueprint Podcast. Um, man, I hope you guys have had an amazing weekend amazing week right and it was just a few weeks ago where i was saying that summer wasn't over and it didn't end to september 27th or something like that and now as you see right we are very much in fall and man but i'm enjoying it now you hear me say this i i, I don't mind changes changing of seasons you know why i don't mind because right i'm here to experience them and so uh, i want to welcome you back man and thank you for last week man last week was so so wonderful so powerful we had uh the waba final four right uh it started last weekend on friday we had the semifinals, and then we had the championship on on saturday saturday afternoon and then we had the all-star game man them young ladies balled out and i want to say congratulations particularly to the dc cyclones of the waba and uh they 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 came with a mission they had a purpose in mind and that was to win the championship this is their second championship of the waba and if you're not aware um you know waba was started by the president and ceo Marsha Blunt and uh, she was a man a teammate along with my wife they played in high school together first women's state championship in the history of New York um, you know my wife and Marsha were you know amazing teammates they had an amazing team they went undefeated that year and and out of it Marsha always had a desire uh, a love for, for for basketball and she was the first African-American woman to have her own professional men's basketball team in the ABA, right? And then she had an idea, right? And she started the, uh, you know, she started the WABA in which my wife is a owner here in Mount Vernon, New York of the Shamrocks, the Mount Vernon Shamrocks. And they were in the final four, 18 teams in the WABA and last last week last weekend on saturday we were live we actually were live all weekend long because we streamed the games right and had all the interviews and different things like that we streamed the semifinals uh we had a live interview on saturday morning with the coaches and owners and all those different things and i think it's 100 percent. if i'm not sure i could be wrong but 100 percent of the ownership are African-Americans. And then the other thing I like about it too, uh, you know, is that, um, you, you know, not just the ownership, right. And their responsibility to the team, man, but I, you know, I just enjoyed the coaches and, and man, even the church, uh, some, some of the pastors from the churches now own, you know, WABA teams and, and man, I think, you know, it, it was just a marvelous weekend. It was our second one, uh, the second year that we had it in Greensboro, North Carolina. And it was just a really, really good time. Um, you know, I'm a little disappointed because our team did not win. Right. But I, we couldn't be biased. And the best team won. Um, I, was, I was really excited about the final four. I was excited about the all-star team. Congratulations to Marsha Blunt and her whole team. They were amazing that weekend. And, you know, we had decent weather. Because you remember last year we had, the, <laughs> we had the bad storms and everything, right? So that's Marsha right there. Uh, that's us the last week. Man, it was, a, it was just a good time. So uh, congratulations. I'm looking forward to, uh, look, 
if you guys are interested, I think I'll my wife is going to put something up there at some point uh, where you can support or find out more information about the WABA and how you can get involved. You know, so so without further ado, I want to drop my this is my um, my little miniature basketball. Right. It's my seed. It's my my pebble. Right. I usually drop my pebble in the pond. Right. You hear that little bounce? Drop my pebble in the pond because I'm expecting the ripple effect of the show tonight. So let's get rolling. I think this is going to be exciting. I love innovation. I love creativity. I love good imagination. Right. And I love it when people dream stuff and it come true. Right. And you make it happen. Uh, so let's get started. I want to start with my book of the week. There was a party for Langston, right? And that's Langston Hughes by Jason, Jason Reynolds. And uh, Jason is a renowned author, right? And this is his new book, right? I didn't get a chance to read it yet, but I was listening to the commentary and I was, I seen him on it the morning show and i was like wow man pretty interesting and then i started to look him up but that that's an interesting book because i just remember my um my father-in-law we call poppy and i call him rev you know and he was a big big fan particularly of african-american community african-american awareness uh african-american pride and Langston Hughes was a tremendous one and one one his favorite. And uh man, my wife and her sister and brother, man, he used to make them, you know, un, you know, know about uh particularly black poetry. And he also had his own poetry book as well. And uh you ought to check that out. And I think I got a second one too. This author has many books, not just not just that one book, but he has many books. So Check him out, Jason Reynolds. Uh, check him out and the many books that he has there. I've been looking looking him up online, listening to to his interviews and comments on on all his different books. He he's this guy's amazing, man. He's, there was a party for Langston, and that's Langston Hughes, right at the Schomburg. That party was at the Schomburg, right and. Uh, just amazing. I think Maya Angelou was there and a, a number of people and he writes a story about that particular situation. So here's my let me jump right into my word of the week. Innovator. Right, man. I was just mentioning that word, man, how we have to be innovators. You know, I love innovation. Right. And and I love creativity. Right. And I'm just excited, man. We come up with ideas. A lot of us come up with ideas. We come up with thoughts and stuff like that. They come to our minds and we say, yeah, man, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But at the end of the day, we don't put it into action. So it never it never comes to an into existence. Right. So um, let's let's move on. My uh, peers, my my hill hopper, Pierce Hopper affirmation quote moment. It says. There is one thing that God says to every believer, regardless of his of his circumstances. Trust me. I like that. You know, I, I can use that <laughs> that affirmation right every morning. Get up. What should I do when I wake up? I tell God I'm going to trust you today, no matter what the situation is, no matter what the weather is, no matter what the circumstances are, Lord. Right. You woke me up this morning. Right. You allow me to be here. Right. In every situation that happens, I'm going to trust you. Right. I like that. I like that a lot. So I like that affirmation. So here's my music and movie of the week. Right. Uh, Broken English by T-Bone. Right. I, I mean, he's a gospel rapper. You know, I like him, man. He got a lot of energy, a lot of fire. He was also in my movie of the week which is fighting temptation. He was along with Cupid Gooden Jr. And Beyonce, he was also in the music. He was in the movie. Remember, he was the prisoner, right? Who was rapping and stuff like that. Uh, and and uh, he's still relevant today, right? I, you know, I love his music and uh, it's awesome. So let's, here's my person of the week. 
Pauletta Washington, as you know, um, Pauletta and Denzel were uh, forwarders. They they forwarded my book uh, from the Boys and Girls Club to the NBA Life on the Narrow Road. And Pauletta, we just see Denzel, right? And, you know, Denzel always talks about, he always talks about his wife and, and he wouldn't be here. He wouldn't be able to do what he needed to do if it wasn't for his wife. And man, at one, you know, we don't know Paul Letter that well, although she's been in a lot of different movies, right? And we don't, we, we don't even know that she was a, a, a constant, she was a great pianist, you know, back in the day. Uh, just, just amazing. Right. But, you know, she put that on the side, right. And, uh, giving it Denzel an opportunity to be who he is. Um, and, and so I respect her, you know, I respect that she, she took care for her, her children and done a wonderful job for her four children. You know, she's just an amazing person and she's my person of the week. Right. And I'm hoping that in the future, Right. I would say some hopefully before the end of the year, man, I'm going to have her on the blueprint. That's going to be my challenge to get her on the blueprint. We we were close a couple of times uh, early in the year. And at the end of last year, we were very close to having her on. And but I'm looking forward to having her on. I think it's going to be an amazing conversation. And then. Oh, who we got here. Happy born day. Now that's a name right there. Maz King Matthews, man. Newborn. Got a lot of hair too. <laughs> uh that's our cousin's juice. Yeah, that's his uh, his little one. And man, just came about. And then I want to say congratulations to now the bishop, Kimmy covington johnson we were at the ceremony on yesterday man uh if if there's a person who deserves to be bishop right uh kimmy <laughs> pastor kimmy should you know she all the qualifications all the things that you're looking for in in terms of being a bishop you know her dedication her love man just powerful man and yesterday this whole ceremony was just wonderful man i was i was happy for her she looked a little tired Right. Because there was a whole lot going on. Right. And I don't know what she had to do to cross the finish line to get to become a bishop. But uh, looked like she completed it. Right. And now she can get some rest. Right. And recover and then get back into the, you know, doing what she does. She's just she's just awesome. man. and her and her husband. Um, my wife was over there crying when her husband was talking, <laughs> talking about her in private. And man. Let me tell you something that 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 touched my heart, too, man. It's always good to see, you know, the love of a man and a woman, a uh, husband and a wife. And man, Anthony endures, endures Pastor Kimmy. And it, it let me tell you something. It was just it was spectacular. What he said, the whole thing about her, man, every word I agree with. Right. So thank you. And congratulations. Yeah. And I just want to make you aware that in October is breast cancer month, uh, breast cancer awareness month. And, you know, early detection is important. And I know a whole lot of people, you know, know a lot of people that have, um, survived this, uh, has survived cancer, particularly breast cancer. And hey, on the show that all this month, we're going to be talking about it and we're going to make people more aware, make sure you get your checkups right and uh handle your business man because you only get one life right you get one life to live and you want to live it as long as you can right by taking care of yourself so and then next ah gotta say this my wife this is the installation service my wife is becoming an assistant pastor on save this date october 28th at 12 p.m at Emmanuel Pentecostal Faith Temple, 344 South Fifth Avenue, Mount Vernon, New York, under the pastorship of Derek Adams. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, she, <laughs> my wife is awesome, right? And she teaches an awesome Bible study, right? And she's organized, she's structured, right? And uh, 
yeah, she's good. And today I was over at the signing. She had a book signing today at the Mount Vernon, Con Con uh, Mount Vernon Heights Congregational Church. Man, it was good. A lot of people out. She sold a lot of books already, man. I mean, uh, when it first book first came out, people were calling, man. Uh, man, you can get it on what I think it's on Amazon. I mean, you, you, you can get it every kind of way you want to get it. Uh, she got it. It's right behind me. I'm checking it out. See right there is right there it's called. So what? Um, but Hey, get your copy. Right. And, uh, we're going to, we're going to have a few more. I'm sure she's going to have a bunch more, uh, book signings, but today was awesome. It was number one and we're just getting started. And then on, Saturday, November the 18th at five o'clock and Sunday, November the 19th at five o'clock, the Revelators Dance Troupe presents The Wiz uh, at the Dole Center in Mount Vernon, New York. Man, this is, I think, their second run at The Wiz, right? Uh, they did it a while back. My, even my kids, my son and my daughter uh, and my nephew, my son, my son was the Scarecrow, my daughter was Dorothy. And, and my nephew was, um, he was a lion and, and then even the dog was Toto. We had a, <laughs> that was crazy ruffles. I think it was ruffles was Toto. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good, these young people are so talented, man. You get a chance to come out, come out and check them out. Right. And be supportive. And then on October the 12th, uh, next, this is this coming Thursday, um, NCADD National Council of Alcohol and Drug Dependency. Uh, I'm going to be honored with the Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, man, it's, that's it's going to be an awesome time. It's an it's an amazing organization uh, doing some amazing work. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on out in the world, particularly around addiction, and they do a wonderful job. And they're having their 20th anniversary be benefit and awards dinner, and and then, you know, next on the 21st, October 21st, Saturday, the King Movement, Westchester is presenting uh, Selfie Dad at the Mount Vernon Public Library. Right. Uh, man, make sure you guys come out. It's going to be a wonderful it's going to be a wonderful time. It's a men's fellowship uh, from one to four p.m. It's, it's going to be a wonderful discussion. And I I'm excited to, to to be able to present that uh, for the community. And coming up, October the 15th, we have Judith Watson. She's the CEO of the Mount Vernon Neighborhood Health Center. Uh, that's going to be a great conversation as well. I'm looking forward to have the conversation with Judith. She's done a, she's done s such a good job, right? I don't hear about too many neighborhood, com neighborhood health community centers, um, but hers, She's done an amazing job there. I remember when it first started, it was great. Then it kind of just, you know, and but now it's back and they're doing a wonderful job with our community in regards around the area of health. Let me say they were amazing during the pandemic and they're still doing great work. And then I also have Dr. K Veronica Smith. She's the acting superintendent of the Montgomery School District. Uh, she's coming up on October 22nd, 22nd. And look, this, this is going to be a great month, you know, and tonight we're starting with tonight. It's going to be even more. It's going to be amazing. Right. Uh, so I guess we're getting ready to roll here. I think we do all the upfront stuff. Uh, check out this video and then we'll be right into the show. for safety in Uptown Columbus. Last month, a Columbus State University graduate student and employee tragically died after being struck by a dump truck while crossing the street. Newsletter 9's Katie Kamen is live in Uptown Columbus where, uh, Katie, you talked uh, to a woman who's trying to make Uptown's crosswalks safer and more accessible. So what is the plan? You may not think about it when you cross the street, but this action might be a lot more complicated and a lot more dangerous for others like the elderly or those in wheelchairs. But one Columbus woman is trying to change that. Helen Dowdell says the tragic death of William W.D. Feeney while he was crossing the street in his wheelchair really made an impact on her. I couldn't sleep for a couple of days. 
especially because of her father. I was a caretaker to my father who was in a wheelchair. So she feels Uptown should be safer and more accessible for those with limited mobility so they can enjoy Uptown the same way everyone can. Instead of just having a concern and not addressing it, let me at least write a letter and see if, if we can if I can get some interest or some other people who may feel the same way. So she contacted Columbus City Council members and the Columbus City Engineer, even going so far to write this letter to U.S. Congressman Sanford Bishop. What she wants? And if, there, if you can visualize a, a box there or an implement there with a handicap sign that would flash. Also, longer times for people to cross and a noise to signal it's safe to travel across the street. The Columbus City Engineering Department says, As an engineer, I'm always open to hear if there are new methods or new ways of making it uh, safer. One way Dowdell says it can be safer is to consider the different vantage point of people in wheelchairs. They can't make eye contact with a motorist like we do. And at the end of the day, she says, even if you're not in a wheelchair, you should still care. Disabled individuals, it's our job as citizens to protect those people. It's our duty. And so we should care because we're all, we're all in this together. Dowdell says these changes need to come now instead of after another tragic accident. She needs support, so if you want to know how you can help, visit our website at WTVM.com. Live in Uptown Columbus, Katie Kamen, WTVM News Leader 9. So I hope that folks are listening and it helps. All right, Katie, thank you so much. Yeah, let's welcome to the blueprint, <laughs> Dr. Helen Brown. Hello. Dr. How you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you for having me. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Now, let me let me start off by saying, um, you know, a good friend of mine we met some years ago uh, when I was at the Boys and Girls Club, uh, Steve Jacobs. And uh, Steve, man, has a, a lot of wonderful ideas. I mean, he knows a lot of people. Man, loves the network. Uh, just a great guy, and man he just brought you up he said man you gotta have you know dr brown on and he he told me about what you were trying to do and what you were doing and i was like wow and it touched me right away um instantly when he started talking about and he sent me the article so he, he texted me the article i started reading the article man i and i was i was really like you know touched by it because my wife and i um, I have a son, uh, Isaiah, uh, who was born with spina bifida. So he, most of his life, he's been in a wheelchair, right? And now he just turned 28 and he's a community, community, community guy, right? And he's independent. So uh, he's all over Mount Vernon crossing streets, right? And I think my wife, probably a lot, a lot more than I is always where's Isaiah, you know, where's he at? Where, where's he going? And he's willing everywhere. I mean, like, you know, he's willing all over my Vernon. <laughs> so he has to cross the street. So it, it touched, um, it touched me a lot. Um, because you never think about, it. you just think about like, Hey man, you know, he's out there. He's good. God got him, you know, but then, you know, I started when when I read the article, I started thinking about like last year, my my um my daughter's father in law. He was just walking. Right. And so, uh, you know, a person hit him, a pedestrian hit him, you know, and uh, so I start, you know, you started your mind starts to to race and, you know, started to think about like, man, sa how important safety is. And then as a part of, uh, I think it was the peacekeepers I was involved in. My mom lived across the street from like a supermarket. And, and so I know how difficult it is and how challenging it is to change stuff or get people to do things. Right. right? So in reading the article, I, I realized that we had a hard time because if there's no, uh, crosswalk, right, then the pedestrian is at the mercy, you know, of the driver, 
right. right now once you put in a crosswalk now now the now the driver's at the mercy of the pedestrian but we couldn't we we couldn't get a crosswalk mm. i mean and people were flying so i know <laughs> when you when you were talking we were talking earlier about the challenges you know of us in the local community just asking you know our local politicians to just put across i mean eventually it took a couple, a couple of years but eventually they did put in a crosswalk you know they should have put a stop sign and a light but uh i think we were asking too much but so that's you know i think i i think we had some pictures of my uh of isaiah you know i, I look well i'm a big man now uh yeah so that's that's isaiah so that's that's why it touched me uh you know uh that he's he's moving around trying to help people you know trying to train you know able-bodied kids you know to play basketball talking to them about going to college and you know going to school and staying in school and stuff like that and so he you know i'm through him you know, I met thousands of people in wheelchairs, you know, being in national championships at at an early age, all through high school. And um, yeah, just 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 awesome. So I wanted to start off with that uh, in terms of why, you know, right away, it just instantly when Steve said, hey, Lowe's, you ought to get, you know, Dr. Brown on. I'm like, yes. <laughs> so so talk. So talk a little bit about. Um, you know how this all came about for you thank you again for having me and thank you so much for sharing i say i mean to see the smile like that makes me so happy <laughs> so, um the project started off as a project first of all we adapted a word to be more fitting of people who travel utilizing mobility aids so that's where the word pedestrian came from pedestrian yeah okay and, you know, ped pedestrian is Latin for foot, means to travel by foot. And a crosswalk is for people who are walking exclusively. So initially we classified the population because you cannot budget for what you cannot, what you don't account for. So this was our, our opportunity for, to present something in a way that's not just saying, okay, this person is pedestrian. We know this person is using a mobility aid, a wheelchair a white cane if they're a blind pedestrian. So pedestrian uh, would be appropriate. And to your point, my father and I started this company together. Um, and God gave me this idea. My dad was a veteran and a wheelchair user. And we had a lot of different uh, challenges as a co-enabled family, you know, such as yourself, traveling, pre-planning trips on where you're going to go, whatever destinations you're going to go to, you have to determine whether or not it's accessible. Um, and we know that one mm. out of four people will develop some sort of disability out of the course of their lifetime. Not only that, it, the largest minority group in the world has nothing to do with race, socioeconomics, uh, sexuality. It, the largest minority group in the world are people living with disabilities. Mm. So um, this project started out of an accident that it occurred. Now, years before, my father and I had conversations about accessibility and he's been a champion for people with disabilities for forever, especially veterans. Um, and my grandparents, I had a grandmother that was a wheelchair user, my brother has a disability as well, and my sister was just recently diagnosed with MS. So this was something that was near and dear to my heart. And the young man that I knew from our community that was struck was struck by a city dump truck driver and the dump truck driver was not aware that he was underneath the vehicle. And unfortunately I was privy to a lot of gory details at the time I was working in the legal field. And I was just really overwhelmed with the disaster and with the response from some of the community members who felt like that this person was not supposed to be in the crosswalk. You know, he was headed to get a coffee, you know, and my dad would always say, this is a human rights issue. And, and it really is. Mm. And I can't take any credit, but I can say God gave me an idea and I didn't get any rest. And uh, when I was waking up out of my sleep, like literally like sketching out 
what it should look like. And one morning I woke up, I was headed into my office and I decided to take a detour and head over to an office depot where I bumped into a young lady and I was asking her to get some drafting paper. Cause I was like, Hey, if I'm going to kind of <laughs> figure this out, you know, and, you know, try to re-engineer a, a signal, I need to get some proper, proper products to do this. Right. And so I bumped into a young lady and she happens to be an intern with the city engineering department where this incident occurred in the first place. And she gave me a contact to a young engineer that was working in the department. And initially, I thought I was going to give this idea to the city so that we could, you know, pilot it and develop it here. Uh, just more of a community effort with, you know, multiple different stakeholders in our community and just kind of do a small project in, in honor of W.D. Feeney. Um, that it didn't turn out that way, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am, you know, today. <laughs> so it didn't turn out that way. And we, uh, even though the city thought it was a great idea, right, they didn't have the bandwidth to carry it out, you know. And what I've learned with working with cities and municipalities, really they have the best intentions ever. And they're bogged down with a lot of projects. You know, they're doing the best they can with the resources that they have. And we were working on this project pre-COVID, pre, COVID, pre uh, you know, uh, new revisiting this accessibility mission that has been kind of resurfacing, you know, through the 1998 law and uh, the anniversary thereof. So we really were in a space where, hey, let's try to develop. And we worked all through COVID. Um, the city couldn't take this on. So I just continued to develop, uh, brought a couple of project management teams on because uh, I was still working my, my day job at the time. And long story short, uh, we ended up developing an Article 1, um, which is your first design. And, uh, and that was after prototyping kind of was becoming very challenging because according to uh, some regulatory rules, you have to have certain types of products and materials in order to test. And so... Um, we decided to go ahead after you know engineering and uh, looking how we, looking how we could create something that was compatible that was going to integrate and kind of be a plug and play and a ready to go solution. We developed a retrofit for our Article One, and um, thank God it you know worked the way um, we expected it to. Um, now that role wasn't easy. Uh, I want that. <laughs> I, I'm going to re go back a little bit because once I met with the city that I was working in, I won't say the name, the engineering department, we discovered that there was nothing after I drew this thing and I literally took a piece of paper and I was like, hey, here, can you look, <laughs> <laughs> look in your little book and see if you can find something that looks like this? And so we have this book and they, it's like a Bible. <laughs> and they're like flipping <laughs> over and we're kind of going through to see if there's anything that looks like that. And at that point, I thought it would be a great time to kind of look at ownership. Uh, not so much that I could, at the time, to think of, oh, I'm gonna you know, own my own company. Uh, it was more so, so I could make sure that we're responsible, right? And there's some accountability. And I know that I have the conviction, therefore I have the accountability and I'm gonna make sure that it gets done. I didn't want this to end up at the bottom of someone's uh, desk as a project that we had time to work on. Um, so, yeah, so we just continue to develop. Oh, and mm. I applied for patents immediately. You talked to who? I applied for patents immediately. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, without a doubt. I mean, Bella. you know, that was my word coming on, innovators. You know, mm -hmm. you know, you you came up with an innovate, you had an innovate, innovative idea, right? And you make it, you make it work. I mean, um, yeah, and I, I've known over the years. Uh, at one time, being being the uh, the honorary coach of um, what was this called? Uh, man, I had it right on my head. You know, how something's in your head. You're like, oh, there it goes, and then it's gone. Um, but uh, the Special Olympics, I was an honorary honorary coach for the Special Olympics. I had a chance to speak. I mean, this is before Isaiah, so. You know, I'm a basketball player and I, I did a lot of speaking engagement in different places and stuff like that. But I got a speak offer to come talk to the uh, 
you know, a whole camp. Um, and I had an, spoke to them and had a great time. We, you know, slapping high fives, do, you know, just doing all kind of amazing things. And then they said, Hey man, you did such a good job with the, with the kids and everything. Um, we want you to be the honorary coach, you know? Uh -huh. So yeah, I was there. They had the parade and stayed all day and watched them, you know, participate in all their uh, sports activities and stuff like that. I was just truly amazed at how special those, um, those young people were. Um, and still are. And, and then I had also met, I was always intrigued by the commissioner for the state of New York for recreation. He was blind. Right. And I was, you know, I, I used to ask him questions like, Hey, you know, all your life you've been, you've been blind. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And then how do you, you know, how do you rise? And, and now you're the, the commissioner for the state of New York in recreation. And yeah, I was always, and it made it's, it made me aware, you know, particularly of, you know, seeing a blind person and how they were getting around, how they were moving around, mm -hmm. right? And you know, how did they get across the street? I mean, you know, if somebody's deaf, I mean, so, and and then having my wife and I having Isaiah, mm -hmm. right, uh, just opened up a whole new world uh, of some very special, wonderful, unique, uh, young people and, and the, and the super parents around them, you know, I call the parents super parents because, you know, they were making the investment, you know, in the, in the life of their children. And it, it's just been an amazing experience, man. Um, you know, spending time with them. And, and this is what I always say when I speak in schools, because Every time I ask somebody, whether they in high school, or whatever they're in, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? Right? Oh, I don't know. You know, I I don't know. It's juniors and seniors in high school. They, nobody knows, right? I don't know what I want to be, you know. But the time I spent with uh, kids, and particularly in the wheelchair basketball area, they all knew, no matter what age they were, they all knew what they wanted to do. Right. I found that fascinating mm -hmm. that, you know, I can walk, talk, see, hear, run. I can do all those things, but I don't know what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Right. But mm -hmm. the person who disabled, they know what they want to do. They, they are, they have it all mapped out. So, uh, so, so this is, you know, near and dear to my heart, uh, in regards to, uh, you know, thinking about this and bringing this, making people aware, um, that we have to be more aware. I become more aware and more sensitive uh, to the disabled population, right? Because you know, I you know, I have a child that's disabled, so you know that works with able-bodied kids. I mean, you know, I always say you put him, you put anybody in the wheelchair, his wheelchair, and they become disabled. I mean, you know, he he's not disabled no more. They they become disabled once they're in the wheelchair because they don't know what to do with it. You know, so, um, yeah, I, I, I know. So there has to be some, some talk a little bit more about the challenges, um, you know, of moving forward with, with the project. I mean, now you end up becoming, you know, a CEO founder, yeah. um, talk, talk about that. I mean, cause it, you know, and talk about it also from, cause one of the things about the blueprint, we, we we try to address the seven spheres of influence, mm -hmm. right? So everybody thinks that ministry is only in the four walls of the church, right? Uh, they don't see, they don't see, uh, you know, God's God's purpose in you, God's gifting to you, and the assignments for those gifts, right? Could be in any one of the spheres of influence, you know. So so talk about that. Um, now that you're in this sphere of influence, now it's business, mm -hmm. right? And it's also humanity in it as well. Yeah, I mean, and that's a great question. It's a, it's it's loaded. <laughs> <laughs> great question. <laughs> <laughs> but I can address all of those things through through my experiences, right? So, um, of course, there has been a lot of challenges. I think there's less than one percent of African Americans working in this industry. Um, 
but I have to go back a little bit because I have okay. to pay homage to take me back parent and how I was raised and where I'm from. And I was not raised where I was taught that I was unable to achieve anything. I had really incredible influences around me. I had really incredible parents. My father was military, was born in Tacoma, Washington, raised down in Southeast Arkansas on the Arkansas side of the Mississippi Delta. Um, my dad was an <laughs> ex-scientist by trade. So farming and, you know, my mother uh, was, a, was a nurse, um, worked two or three jobs, uh, clean, had a cleaning business. Um, uh, then she ended up going to school uh, a non as a non-traditional student to be a hair uh, cosmetologist. I'm not going to say hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, my parents were, you know, very, you know, we were always doing something, you know, uh, I was never taught to have any sort of like limitations, even though I grew up in a very rural community. Um, it really made my imagination go wild. I had a lot of different, um, you know, when you don't have like, you know, certain types of technology and you're around nature and you are, you have different things that are like handed to you, um, like, you know, things that people would consider junk and you take those and you make something out of them. My mother was the queen of retrofitting. It's <laughs> <laughs> the queen of make it last. <laughs> she was the queen of taking care of it. Uh, reusing, repurposing. Now they call it upskilling. <laughs> you know, <laughs> all the things that we're doing now, like I literally watched my mother do, like she could make anything. I remember as a kid, my mom had a, um, she had a, a car seat. Now this is, now I'm dating myself, but she had this car seat. Remember the car, the massage seats with the beads that she would. Oh yeah. Up? Yeah. I remember my mothers were kind of tearing up. So I asked her if I could take these little brown wooden beads and I repurposed them into jewelry and I was selling them to the ladies in our neighborhood that I grew <laughs> up in. Like, you know, <laughs> she took me to Walmart and I um, uh, ended up going to the craft area. Um, and that wasn't a plug for Walmart either, but, you know, needless <laughs> to say, small communities, the Walmarts were like, they were like the shopping malls, you know, because you didn't have many stores to choose from. I think we had one, one, or two, one gas station or so in uh, one of the little areas that I grew up in. And so needless to say, she took me to the craft store. I got some pliers and wire and, you know, I was, you know, I've been doing like kind of like entrepreneurship like forever. And uh, we owned our own farm on my dad's side. My mom's side had, had her own land and stuff. And so you had to be very creative. Um, so I think that going through those changes and um, watching my parents and their struggles and challenges with all of the things that they experienced, like my dad going through, you know, the civil rights era and telling us these stories of like perseverance, how he went to college and how he was told he couldn't go to college and how he uh, ended up going to UAPB at the time that was uh, AM and N. Um, it was an agricultural school and how he kind of persevered in order to get into school. Um, so, and I had my own set of, you know, challenges that I faced. And so perseverance has kind of been like the story of my life. You know, you don't stop. You <laughs> just keep going. You know, success, uh, you know, it's objective, you know, whatever that means to you. But for me, it's family. It's, you know, life. It's God. It's, uh, you know, creation. It's an opportunity to, you know, share my faith. Um, so, yes, this project has come with a whole lot of you know, different challenges, you know, one, my dad used to tell me all, tell me all the time, he'd say, Helen, you're, you're a black woman. He was like, and you're working with a lot of, you know, white men. He was like, who feel like you're not gonna, you're not supposed to be there. He said, and he would tell me all the time, you're gonna have to stand up and fight. Mm -hmm. And in the development, I was so ignorant to the fact that people could push me down that I didn't think that I was incapable of being able to create a signal and <laughs> it was just out of sheer naivety and just like okay um i can do all things through christ who strengthens me and i was constantly like reading my bible i grew up in a um you know in church and um i am not gonna i can't give credit to anything except for my faith it was my faith that has grounded me and any, anything that you believe in is going to be tested so I can understand the engineering aspect of trial and error, trial and error, 
and development and being able to pull a concept together and testing that concept, okay, and then perfecting it. And then once it's perfected, testing some more and bringing in an end user. So for me, the functionality on the engineering process and re-engineering uh, was kind of like easy for me to kind of grasp. And I think it was mainly because of how I grew up. Um, but yes, coming into the industry, everything that I thought I could do was tested, including, you know, working with individuals who nece who didn't necessarily thought think that you belong there. And, you know, it, I faced a lot of rejection just for being a woman and for being, you know, a skin, a beautiful skin color, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, I knew what they thought, but I knew what God told me to do. And that always overrides any opposition. Um, sometimes I feel like Noah building the art because when, originally when I was, uh, you know, talking to different companies in the industry and telling them what I wanted to do, they would just be like, oh, look at this ladies, that's cute, you know, and it <laughs> I had my article one to where I literally had someone tell me to my face, he said, Helen, it's going to be a cold day in hell before you get that traffic signal to an intersection. And my faith was so strong. I told him, hey, Adrian, get your coat because I knew what God told me to do because I knew if he told me to do it, he equipped me to do it. And of course, there's going to be opposition. And of course, it has not been easy, but in doing so, it's developed my faith and it's made my faith get stronger. And I've been able to overcome a lot of obstacles, but it's not in my own strength. It's in the strength that God has given me. And also God is concerned about his people. You know, we're talking about the most vulnerable community in, in, in the world, right? And we're talking about being able to be inclusive and equity and minorities, we know the challenges that we have. We knew the capacity that we had to make contributions to a society and to a country that we built. Right. And even though we were oppressed, we still were able to come in and be the brain and the muscle in the country that helped to sustain this country, beautiful country that we live in right now. With that being said, everything that you think of that could have happened with this project <laughs> happened. Um, and we were fortunate enough to do a pilot uh, in Mississippi with the, with the great mayor um, in Jackson that was um, in a minority city. It was something that I picked, up, picked out uh, to do, um, but it worked out that way. I met a friend years ago when it was time for us to do a pilot and of course, I had all sorts of things. It was a battle. I had all sorts of stuff breaking out, like in my, you know, in in my life, just in general, my personal life. And um, it was just a, you know, a lot of things that were going on that, during the duration of the project. And I and I still had to persevere and continue on because I knew what God told me to do. Um, and so, anyway, I remember having these signals, and we were dealing with the company, and the company were literally <laughs> were playing lots of games with the real world product and that things were being spent in different places and things of that nature. And long story short, it was time to pilot. And in the same area where I thought I was going to be able to, for whatever reason, um, it didn't work that we could do a pilot in that particular city. Mm -hmm. So, I had a friend of mine that was from Mississippi that was in the higher at higher education and a tailor on the side. And um, he gave me a call and he early, he early throughout my project, he would check in and say, Hey, how, how's that project going? Uh, great gentleman. His name is Kyrus Brown. No relation. Great families, uh, great family from uh, down in Mississippi. And he said, I really have someone that I want you to talk with. And he kept telling me this like over and over, over the years. And I was like, I'm not far enough. You know, let me get back to you. You know, I was just kind of, you know, pushing it off because I wanted to make sure that we were, you know, something that we were going to be able to do, to, to do. Long story short, his uncle ended up being the commissioner of the state. And wow. he, minority uh, commissioner, who had been there for like 30 something years. And we were able to uh, pick from some cities that thought about, thought enough of what we were doing to think it was impactful. Um, 
you know, uh, we have some great partnerships. I was able to uh, meet Sandra Morgan, who's Garrett Morgan's uh, granddaughter. She protects the legacy of the Garrett Morgan, uh, you know, his legacy and foundation and patents and all of those things. And well, not patents because his patents were sold to General Electric. But uh, needless to say, and they backed my project as well. Um, and also, uh, you know, applied for patents. We were able to, you know, we got our patents back in 2021. I didn't even know that <laughs> that we had won. To get our, <laughs> I think the year that, that I applied, uh, it was less than 0.02% of people that actually received patents that year, um, which was a blessing from God, which was more affirmation that, or confirmation that I was going in the right direction, even though I didn't have anyone to kind of walk this journey with me. You talk about a blueprint. I feel like I feel like mm. Harry Tubman sometimes because I'm, <laughs> God is constantly speaking to me. I'm constantly adjusting. I'm constantly, you know, having to discern. I'm constantly getting new ideas. It never stops. Um, so we've had a lot of different, you know, challenges. But on top of that, we've had a lot of different confirmations that we were on the right right track. Um, so. Yes, uh, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of challenges. Uh, you know, it's interesting in radio because I'm like, <laughs> you don't want to say anybody's name. Yeah. Because you know, and then also I'm the only patent holder to a traffic control device um, uh, since Garrett Morgan, uh, the only one. Wow. First black woman and the first woman to on a patent to a traffic control device. Uh, the original patent, uh, traffic control device was developed, I want to say, uh, over 150 years ago. And this year marks the 100th year anniversary, uh, the centennial of the invention of Garrett Morgan's uh, traffic signal that we use today um, all over the world. Um, and without his invention, my invention would not exist. So I always give homage and give honor where uh, honor is due, uh, because without that, and I'm sure if we were, if wheelchair users were more independent as they are today, you know, using hand controls to drive, um, you know, and, and basically I say this too, science and technology has basically outpaced our infrastructure. So there's been so many advancements made in science and technology and medicines that wheelchair users, blind pedestrians, but specifically those wheelchair users are being able to live independently. Uh, that means they have their own homes and, you know, working. And this gives us a great opportunity as a country as well to for those individuals to contribute to our workforce. Because all we have to do is corporations, just imagine what you're doing in the radio industry. A wheelchair user can easily come in and do that job with accessible spaces. Not only do we uh, retrofit, you know, spaces like private companies. We I just recently spoke at Packard and Peterbilt. They have a there's a lift that has been invented that can help a wheelchair user be lifted into a vehicle if they have their CDL license. They can still operate a big truck using hand controls and get in and out of their vehicle using a wheelchair lift. You know, it's it's you know it's hmm. it's very inspiring because this way we have a different purview. We have people getting back to work doing things that they love they love without having to be on disability. Think about in the acting community, instead of having actors that are, you know, and there's, I don't want to say whether it's right or wrong, that's not my position, but my <laughs> position is that if someone has a disability, like we don't have to hire someone to play someone with a disability. We don't have to hire someone that is a wheelchair user because there's there are actors that are in wheelchairs that, <laughs> that would love those opportunities. That's right. and, that's, and that's a contribution that they can make to society. I felt like that was a very lengthy answer, but <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that, that was good. Um, you know, because it's, you know, the thing is when you have, uh, and I'm, I'm, I think my wife is there too, uh, can attest to this, that, you know, when we had Isaiah, another world opened up, yeah. you know, and what, what you're doing is, you know, to, continue to open that world um and so it's it's interesting because uh at you know being an executive director of the boys and girls club i was thinking like okay where does isaiah go to recreate mm -hmm. right and so he was participating in elementary school and in the middle school 
Uh, I was like, man, he's participating there. He's participating in phys ed. You know, he's doing all the other things, you know, to the best of his ability in, in his school. Why can't he be a member of the Boys and Girls Club? So he ended up, you know, being a member of the Boys and Girls Club and having, you know, doing the same thing the other kids are doing, playing ping pong, pool, whatever, doing his homework, uh, doing all the things. And we didn't have, he happened to be strong enough that uh he could get up and down the stairs and we could take it because we didn't have an elevator or an escalator we didn't have any of those things in, in in the club but it made us aware right and and so we had to become handicap accessible in regards to the bathroom we had to build another bathroom i mean it was it was a uh, you know it was, it was life-changing but some organizations don't really want to change right because they only serve in one population you know but isaiah was an example for schools right and he was an example for the boys and girls club and he ended up becoming a two-time youth of the year for the boys and girls club uh, yeah so, so and to the point, the, not to cut you off but you go ahead no you go ahead no no i was just gonna say there are a lot of great cities too you know we talk about smart cities but i always say it's not smart when you don't include everyone but um, the city of Atlanta and, of course, some other cities like across the United States are doing well. They have an ATL equity where they're creating spaces that I give it up to that mayor for, you know, taking the time to talk about how to create an equitable space and acknowledge that, hey, there are pedestrians out here. We have opportunities to open up our city to make it safe for all, not just for one population, uh, what we call like ableism. Ableism, when you have a design framework and you don't incorporate people who are not, you know, that we design, ableism is like designing for, for people who are not a part of your design framework without having them a part of the development, which makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> and as a co-enabled family, I'm sure you and Patrice understand that in order to design, Isaiah needs to be a part of the process because That's he's right. a human being. And sometimes we we uh, categorize mobility challenges with diminished capacity. Like you feel like, oh, someone's in a wheelchair, so they have diminished capacity, which is not true at all. As a matter of fact, they have a greater purview, purview as far as design-wise that can really land in the development of an ecosystem that is more universal. So we're classified as a universal design system. That means anyone can use it. And it's, and it's great for everyone. Remember when the curb cuts were first uh, you know, installed, it was just, it was with wheelchair users in mind, but then parents with their strollers, they were able to use them and the white cane. So at the end, end of the day, at the beginning of the day, you know, having the population included and thinking about universal design, it's a smart idea and it was God's idea. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, it was God's idea. You know, and the only the only thing I wanted to add to that, if you don't, if I don't mind, and then I'm going to get out of your way. Um, I remember when. Isaiah was, I want to say, a sophomore, junior in high school, and the elevator broke. Whoa. And instead of bringing the kids down to him to work with him, they put him in like a room and he didn't get the proper education, the ability to ask questions with his peers because they didn't. And it took them a such a long time for them to make the adjustment. We actually had to call Gary Pretlow, um, our assemblyman, and say something needs to be done because he was being mistreated because of his disability and because the elevator didn't work he was stuck and he went i think about a month right Lowe's, where mm -hmm. they put him in like a room a couple of months yeah they put him like in a room and he had to go online while the rest of the kids were in class and he didn't get the interaction and i was furious because sometimes kids don't have somebody to advocate for them to help them through uh, and to navigate the political the political or the politics of the whole thing and so he was stuck in 
everybody else's banter. Uh, well, we can't get the elevator fixed. Oh, we don't have this. We don't have the money. Or we don't have the time. We don't have the staff. We don't have this. And whatever it was, this kid suffered for about a month or two without the proper education because of that. And so, you know, whenever somebody steps up to advocate for people with disabilities, I'm all in. I'm definitely all in. So, you know, thank you for what you do, Doc, because it's really necessary and you're the voice to the voiceless. Thank you for that. That's a touching story, Patrice. Thank you for sharing that. And and the thing is, we, because of who we are, mm -hmm. right? Um, and this is one of the things we were talking to parents about some, some time ago with a gentleman by the name of uh mr centwali right and he used to always teach try to teach parents about the importance of their voice right so we we were able to advocate for our mm -hmm. children right and a lot of people don't so if a person that doesn't have the ability to advocate right then that child would have sat there right because the parent would say oh yeah well, you know the elevator is not fixed Right. And then they would just left it alone because after two or three times, nothing gets done and it would just stay the same. But if you have the ability to advocate, we had the ability to advocate because we knew people, mm -hmm. you know, we we knew who to go to. We knew who to call. Uh, and, and so eventually things got done. But think about a whole society out there that can't advocate, that people will pay no attention to. Right. And don't really care. So so Isaiah was invited by the city council of Mount Vernon to participate on. And, and I don't know the correct title of it. Um, um, I think Caitlin is was I saw her um, comment um, and I'm not sure if she she logged off, but she put him on. They put him on a committee that deals with transportation that is specific for those people who are um, who are disabled, who are not able to, you know, uh, travel the bus and the trains and the, I mean, the bus and the cabs. And so he's supposed to be part of that so that he can be a voice for others. Because one of the things Isaiah does do now is he advocates for others. When, when he played wheelchair basketball, I remember one time there was a team that they played against and he had a guy on his team that could barely you know move barely could do things and they said oh he's no longer able to play because he's over a certain age and isaiah said regardless of his age his disability is not like it's not going to make a difference he's not going to shoot the, the ball from half court give him the opportunity to play and i remember watching isaiah completely advocate for this young man and that to me was so so impressive yeah yeah I don't, did we did we leave did we lose that yes but i'm sure she'll come back on <laughs> yeah no i you know I, I i think that um you know that's in that's important uh particularly parents are so powerful they just they have such a powerful voice and and you have to advocate for your children if you don't who will and and uh i mean disabled or able body hey you should always advocate for your children i mean you you are there you are their heroes and you need to advocate for them and 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 so yeah i mean this is just uh you know bringing awareness that there's a you know there's a population of people out there who are wonderful, wonderful people. Um, and, and they are amazing and we should be aware that we, and this is the, I think when doc comes back on, Dr. Brown comes back on and we're going to have a conversation about, um, I think the importance of, uh, God and technology, uh, because we assume that, uh, technology is not a part of God's will. Right. Uh, and I think we assume that, you know, the you know, some people say, you know, that uh, Jesus is going to return uh, when every person in the world hears a hears a message. Uh, he, you know, here's God's word here. You know, I, and I think that uh, technology is going to play an ama a major part of the whole world hearing the message. Right. And, and so. Uh, for all those who are down, I know some of us are getting a little older and we don't like technology, but it's a part of God. I mean, 
this is a part of God's plan. Technology is just so important and so powerful. And, and, uh, you know, what Dr. Brown is talking about, man, is, you know, just like we see the street lights out there and just like we see the walk, not all of them work, you know, <laughs> the, the countdown, uh, you know, little countdown signs and different things like that. Uh, you know, the hand up that stops you from going and then, 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 the, then the walking, uh, you know, then you get to walk across. Once you see the sign, you see the hand say stopped. Although most people don't stop walking. They just keep walking, especially if you're in New York city. Right. And then when it changes, you know, a little, little person comes up and, they, and, and you can walk across the street, supposedly, uh, without getting hit. Um, but you know, just imagine we can, we, as able body, we have that, we have those privileges, those benefits, you know, but if some person is disabled and they're in a wheelchair, right i mean they're lower it's like a kid walking across the street i yeah. mean uh so so i talk about that you know i like that um what i mean you said you already have a you already have a prototype you had you, you have a you have the system right yeah. and and this and you have it in one of the places right i think it, you said it looks like that i guess yeah that's absolutely thank you for showing that yeah that's a general yeah. research yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah. So, how does so it work? Yeah. So, we're a real world, world product. Uh, you you gave a great description of the existing system. So, just imagine everywhere where if you go, I don't know if you have the capacity to go back to the picture. Okay. So, mm -hmm. the smaller picture to uh, my right, maybe your audience is left or right, but the smaller picture is what we call wheel head. Um, it's beneath the walking man. That's where it's installed and it activates uh, when a wheelchair user is entering a crosswalk. It's on the same type of system. We can add timing, additional timing. Uh, the bigger sign, um, or the biggest, bigger signal uh, is, is on that mast arm. Uh, we also have another type of design that's not pictured here. Um, that can adhere to the bottom of the traditional traffic signal. So you basically activate from an accessible push button system. Uh, you press that button and it activates. Um, we in, in the places that we are at now, we put them in, in places of greatest need. Uh, for instance, if you think about research hospitals, facilities, um, universities, places that students are going, I'm, I'm a part of Blaze Sports America. I think I was talking about that earlier. And it's one of the largest adaptive sports programs in the country for veterans and young youth wheelchair basketball players. And we have other uh, types of adaptive programs like tennis and golf and swimming. So all of our students in our program, we have a 100% graduation rate and they're going off to college at schools that have adaptive programs. and they're getting their degree and they're staying in those states and working. So we go in places of greatest need and obviously places where people have been struck that those are areas that we can install in. We are ready to go now. We can place orders today. Oh, <laughs> but, nice. um, we have, um, so basically that's how we work. We have a national mobilizing Wildestrian campaign that was created by Sloan Meek and, um, as well as, as um, oh my goodness, I'm, uh, Wendy Leasum. I almost forgot her name, but they are in the Durham Triangle area. They uh, put together this mobilizing wheel gesturing campaign so that citizens and constituents across the United States who are affected, which is you know one in four people, but directly affected or indirectly affected can talk to their city officials, uh, send a letter into their ADA council, um, to let them know what's needed in the city. And by law, you know, you have the right to not only ask for these things, but the city can, you know, do it, you know, look at your product and say, okay, hey, this is something that we can, we can use. And those are things that we need to get done, you know, sooner than later, because we lose 528 wheelchair users and accidents and crosswalks, you know, 70% of all accidents happen in the intersection. And like you and I were discussing earlier, the largest minority group in the world are people living with disabilities. It makes up 15% of the world's population and it's only going to increase. So today, what can someone do to, 
see if they can have this in their city. It's, it's as simple as, um, you know, I can't, we have advocates that reach out from all over the United States and overseas. I, I don't have solutions for every single thing, but I, we can try to build solutions for every single problem in the disability community. But one that we can help with is access, get you out of being stuck and landlocked. Um, we also can work in airports. And when you talk about challenges, yes, as a minority contractor working, um, <laughs> it comes with its own set of you know challenges, but I'm here to do my creator's will. And, um, you know, it's like the song, you know, I'm not going to stop until, you know, we get to a point where we are including everyone. Now, I was hoping my dad was going to be the first person to cross in the accessible uh, traffic signal intersection, <laughs> but it didn't happen that way. He passed last year. Oh, and, sorry, yeah. uh, but I, I give a lot of you know credit to him for getting me prepared for this battle that we've been in. But we've had a lot of success, and for that, I'm, you know, incredibly thankful to God and all of our supporters, and you know, and yourself for giving us a platform to uh, you know come on and discuss you know what what we're doing in this industry. Um, and, you know, people say things like, "Oh, if, if you were this or if you were that." I can't go off of ifs. Um, I can only be who I am and continue to, you know, work as hard as I can, you know, bit by bit, brick by brick. You right. know, and I feel like we've made a pretty big impact. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I well, how, how do people um, find out more information? Um, um, so they can go to our website, www.wildestrian.com. Um, and then, of course, if you guys can give anyone, you know, my direct information, if they send and, you know, want to send an email or a um, or call the company, um, we can come out and do site visits, um, you know, and obviously we have a lot of companies now who are interested in making their spaces accessible. So um, obviously they can reach out to me, info at wildestrian.com. Um, that what that will come directly to uh, someone on our team and definitely we would definitely take it very seriously we have the most uh the highest amount that i want I, i'm trying to find a way to say this but we have we're experts in what we do like we didn't just wake up yesterday there's a lot of people you know showing up talking about accessibility that are just doing it as a money grab no this is who we are we're 100 percent disabled owned uh, you know, disability owned company, veteran owned company. And this is who we are. We know, we know what the data says. We know how to build spaces. We know how to uh, add to spaces that are not, that are just doing what we call minimum compliance. I have a, um, one of our, our leads down in, um, down in one of our, in the Southeast region. Um, she was, in a meeting we had with this airport, um, we were discussing this design plan. And don't get me wrong, Lo, Lo, sometimes I get really, it's really heavy sometimes when you're talking to officials and stuff and they talk about like taking a vote on like humanitarian type of issues. It's kind of like, it makes, it makes me a little bit sick to my stomach that we have to, we're asking permission for someone not to be struck when you have a walking man there clearly welcoming that person that that symbol to the intersection and then we don't have anything representative of someone who uses a mobility aid to me that's not equity um but needless to say we were in a meeting having a discussion and she had never shared this story with me but she uh shared a story about her son evan who's one of our advocates he is 15 years old he has cerebral palsy and he's a tremendous young man. And she had went to a restroom at, at an airport and the accessible stall was taken and Evan really had to go to the restroom. And because that accessible stall was taken by an able-bodied person, and he's older at this point, he's headed to an appointment at a hospital on the East, on the East Coast that treats, has some advanced treatment for his condition. And she told the story how she had to, she had no other choice but to lay him down on the dirty floor and to change his clothes because they couldn't get into a restroom because there was only one. And that one was taken by someone who was able-bodied. So when you talk about minimum compliance, mm. <laughs> to me, <laughs> mediocrity, just let's just do the best. Let's just give you just enough 
you know, that's not enough. And that's where the advocate of me turns out. Because people used to tell me a lot of things at first. Oh, you have a lot of fire and passion. No, I'm like, no, we're here to get this done. I'm not here to ask you anything. This is what <laughs> we're doing. And this is how we're going to do it. And I'm going to comply with everything that you say as far as regulatory wise, but we're not going to allow for this to continue. Um, I gave an example about, you know, going out to going out to fine dining with a group of friends and you let's say you divide them in half. You have five here, five there on the other side of the table and someone and the waiter approaches the table and they he takes the order. Everyone orders spaghetti. On one side of the table, when he returns with the order, he has this beautiful plate of spaghetti for each individual person on, let's say, on the right side. On the left side, he brings, you know, raw turkey or raw hamburger meat, uh, you know, spaghetti that's, you know, uncooked, uh, a cup of water, a pot, a plate, so you can put it together yourself. That's what we're doing when we're talking about minimum compliance. So mm. one place you kind of have it all figured out, and the other one you're asking this person hey, listen, just put it all together yourself. That's not equity. Hmm. It's not. Yeah, I, I, agree, I agree with you 100, um, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, again, people, you know, the more that you are available, the more that you bring about this awareness, it's, it's awareness and making people accountable. Right? Because sure. it's, no, it, it's more than just, okay, yeah, I'm aware, right? <laughs> okay, now what you going to do about this? Uh, and, and, and those are, those are the challenges. It is interesting because when, when we talk about, um, you know, Isaiah, um, and it, I want to shift it, you know, for just a second, because I was thinking like, man, with Isaiah, he had about every, we used to meet, I think once a month, social worker, all the people that have to do in the school district in his IEPs and, you know, all the, all those different things, you know, speech therapy, you know, physical therapy, you know, all those kind of things that he, you know, is he getting it, you know, so, you know what I'm saying? So are we going through all that as parents? We're there, we're listening to the report. Uh, cause of course you're getting a report on how well he's doing, you know, how well he's doing, he's progressing so forth and so on for him. Right. I mean, because we, we were advocating for this, you yeah. know, and so on the other end, you know, for those who are able-bodied, right? A lot of kids are having a lot of problems and situations, you know, who are able-bodied, right? But they don't have the details that Isaiah was getting. I was thinking like some of these, <laughs> some of these kids need speech therapy. They need, there's a lot of things they need too as well. You know, I think every kid needs something, you know, um, not everybody's perfect. I mean, it has it all, all together, but in some instances, they don't get all the benefits that they need or the help that they need in order that they could be the product, a productive student or person. I'm just, I just flipped on the other side because I've seen it. You know, I've seen it on the side with Isaiah, you know, and, and I've seen it on the other side where a lot of kids, particularly African-American kids, are not getting, you know, they should be, some should be, now I don't want to test kids just to put them on medication. That's right. No, I don't, I don't want, I, I'm not a believer of that, but I think like all the help that we, we were able to advocate for Isaiah, you know, should be given the same help on the other end as well. No. Absolutely. Um, it's about equity and uh, making sure that they get everything, everyone gets treated the same, you know, and that's something that we advocate for. We even have, you know, a young lady that had a challenge like with the tests uh, that, you know, we think about people who are visually impaired, things that were brought to our attention. On the advocacy side of things, we do work really hard to make sure that we are aware of things that people are facing in the com in the commu disability community so that we can raise awareness. I do know with having, you know, a platform and working in this space that people look at look to you for solutions. And I've been very fortunate that we've been able to build solutions with a really great team of people who think what we're doing is important and more importantly, working with those individuals who are in the community, who are end users, who can say, hey, yeah, this is what we need. If this was here, this would have saved this person's life. So it's all interconnected. You know, I, I think there's a lot of different cross sections that uh, that need support. And 
it starts with, we call, I call it CIA, classify, identify, and acknowledge. If we never had these conversations, if we continue to act shock every time we see someone in a wheelchair, um, then we're kind of like uh, basically slowing down our evolution as a society. We have a great opportunity here with ADA and we have a great opportunity with making sure we uh, bring the disability community to the table and not just, you know, one of the things that I hear a lot when we are talking to different, you know, community organizations and different groups. And, you know, I work, uh, I give insight to transit departments, go to those meetings. I have advocates sometimes that write me like this is a lot of like. I'm, you know, I'm a CEO and founder, but at my heart and core, this is advocacy work. Like this is grassroots. Like, you know, I have an advocate send me a message and say, you know, hey, Dr. Helen, can you, uh, I can't get from, from my neighborhood to the transit that I'm taking is dropping me off, but they don't have a way to pick me up. You know, I get done with my exercise at the recreation center. I need to go work out, but I don't have a way back home. So I have to go to the transit meetings like and I can't think that it's like I'm so that no, this is what God, this is what I've called, been called to do. This is my purpose. And so I show up at the meetings and sometimes people are happy to see me there. Um, <laughs> you know, and I'm always happy to see them. Show me what you're doing. OK, well, we don't need more, you know test you know you can test all day long and you can do studies all day long but sometimes all you have to do is look at the statistics you know look look at the data and then look at building solutions and the people who are most affected like you talk about minorities might be imagine being a being a minority and double down on the other challenges that you have on top of being a minority and being like you know isaiah uh of wildestrian uh on top of being, you know, the educational dis, uh, disadvantages, you know, the story that your wife just told me, like, literally made my heart sink. I want to go back and find those people. <laughs> what were you thinking about? You know, it's just the lack of humanity. And if we could just connect to the human spirit and say, human to human, does this even make sense? You know, why are we living in a world? And I wish we could have showed our video on here tonight. Maybe I'll send it to you another time. But, you know, why are we okay with accepting the fact that we have this amazing population that's landlocked. Why, right. why is the child sitting in a room by himself? And one of the number one things, uh, I was at the Shepherd Center, which is the number one research hospital for spinal cord injuries in the state of Georgia. And we were doing a tour there. And one of the, uh, the, the person who was conducting our tour was telling us that one of the number one things that a child wants to do or a student wants to do when they are in the uh, research hospital learning how to, uh, you know, it's like a rebirth and they're relearning life and they're relearning to do things uh, after their injury, right? They want to go back to school and be around their friends. Human interaction, human, the human spirit is incredible, but we need each other. Isolating individuals oh, to be... Yeah by themselves and 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 isaiah you guys are so so blessed to have him he's blessed to have you look at the ecosystem that you get look how many people he's brought into your into your space that you may have never met before That's so right. we're doing a disservice to our future and we used to say the future is right now that was our company tagline now we say I, we say the world is watching us you know we can't uh we can't tout on being this great country and this great nation when we have this great disparity and we and, it, and it's left unanswered we don't have that type of time mm. we as soon as you see the the problem you need to facilitate the solution effectively you need to execute and you need to do it and be steadfast you don't have the time for someone see when i talk to a parent and this is what i tell people this is why i saw city, city, city leaders like i don't sugarcoat it when, when a parent is telling me that they lost their child, it's no problem for me to walk in here and talk to you. No problem. That's right. When they have to bury they, their child over something that could have been prevented. So thank you for this platform, for being able to share. I don't want to continue yeah. on. What, uh, how, how long is your video? It's like one minute. Oh, but we should just send it to text it to us, somebody. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. You know, I mean, you, you on your phone? Sure. I am. I am. I have the computer, though, as, as a backup as we, we read the messages. Um, I have a couple of different ones that we can share. I don't know if I can make you a um, 
um, make you a. And we need to ask my wife about that one. That part. And I should be able to do this, but you know, <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to send this to you now. If it's on the computer that you're on right now, all you have to do is go to present and go to video file and you should be able to upload it right to this right now without having to send it. Thank you for that. Let's see if I can do <laughs> So if it's in there, yep, go to present. I tried to earlier and I just kicked myself off. <laughs> do you see the bottom where it says present underneath when you move out underneath your um, screen? The bottom where it says present. If it's there, it's probably where I cannot so 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 is your is your whole screen the video the picture of me and Lowe's or is it just a small one I can see all three of three of us on here and the comments I guess it's a dash oh you see the comment um the, on the right hand side there should be a box you can meet you can either make the box bigger or it, it says egg actually if you go down to the bottom just scroll down to the bottom you'll see something that says present I okay all right so send it to Lowe's I'll upload it it take it take me a couple of seconds while y'all keep talking if you just send it to him he'll send it right to me <laughs> my apologies it's not showing up that's okay that's sporting so but yeah this is um this is a, a really great opportunity to have this discussion um you know being parents of children of a child who's disabled and not even just our own child i mean we have quite a few children in our family that have some li different levels of disability and so we're very sensitive to those issues all the way around so we love yeah. when somebody's somebody has the voice i appreciate what you guys are doing and i and i want to meet isaiah too like if we can get connected and even go like if he still has some affiliation with this with this with this city with you guys city that we could definitely talk about, you know, work there. For whatever reason, it's given a little bit of time to export. Um, now, if you guys can even get to see me here. Oh yeah, okay. definitely a great opportunity. Yeah. Is it is your is your is your video on YouTube? It is not. Uh, we have okay. so many proprietary things. What's the email to the show? Mm, the, um, you can just send it to my. We'll send it to. I'll put it in the chat in the private chat. Okay, great. You put it in the private chat. I'll share one video. Okay. And then the ideation. So I'll go there. See that's yeah. too. Let's see. But when it arrives, I'll add it. To, I will um, give you some controls. Thanks for proprietary for such a long time. Uh, I just received a chat, and so it really took a tough. It really took a long time before we were doing things publicly. Uh, traditionally, that's not like how things are done, and um, you know, in the industry that we work in. So it was kind of challenging, but yeah, I mean, look. It, it a lot of times when it's God driven, right? Uh, although we we mentioned something earlier about um, the importance of technology, and I, I think I think uh, technology is a part of God's supernatural process. Uh, his creativity, his innovation, right? I mean, I don't think any of us could come up with these things without having, you know, and you know. I, I think, you know, God allows for things to happen, uh, you know, because we always assume that only the only the people who love God get these ideas or mm -hmm. come up with the solutions and stuff like that. And I, and I think that, it, you know, anybody right who has a passion and love for for changing things and helping things grow, regardless of whether or not we think they're in God or not in God, I think is available to all of us who are human. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. The idea comes up and somebody, somebody grabs it and, and they, they do it. Right. And they don't necessarily sometimes believe in God. 
right? I believe that God exists, but God, you know, God uses every, you know, everybody gets, uh, God gives the opportunity to use everybody, right? And whoever pulls it down and wants to do it and it changes people's lives, you know, hey, God gets, <laughs> you know. Like I know for me, like there was so much, we've had so much diversity on this project. I've had people who were believers, people who were atheists, people who were from all backgrounds who believed in humanity and the common, common good, people that, that were openly about things and people that were not. But we were mission minded and um, our affiliations are all mission minded. There are people who believe in what we're doing. Obviously, this is a bipartisan issue. Um, so we don't have to subject ourselves to, OK, make it. Oh, well, this is for this person. This is for this person. No, this is for everybody. This is for right. everybody. So you sent it. You sent it to me. I put it in the chat. Chat. Oh, it says like. Oh, know. so Trees. Trees has it then. I don't want to get everybody's hopes up because <laughs> it was like, wish I could share the controls. Um, no, if you put it, you put it in the chat. I did, but she said that she's had she's having some challenges with it. So, um, yes. Okay, so if we can't do this, I'll make sure that you get it. I I don't know if we have it. Yeah, because I think I emailed you and asked you if you had anything um, in the email uh, that we could use. Um, you probably, I I agree. You probably did. We had a lot of travel this week. Yeah, no, um, no, you 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 on the road, on the road again. <laughs> absolutely, just kidding. I can so. Um, but needless to say, maybe when you guys have time, maybe we can upload it because um, it's giving. Yeah, me like we, a... we, we're going to have to do a part two and we're going to get Isaiah on here. <gasps> Yay. Yay. I, I was hoping that he was going to he was at practice. I think they had a camp or clinic or something like that at the unit at the college. And so he was there all weekend. Well, this uh, month is National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Okay. Is, so oh, yeah. it's a, you know, it's breast cancer awareness month, but it's also national disability employment awareness month and where we're talking about people working in different jobs and things of that nature. So, um, it may be a good time to talk to him since he's working and, uh, you know, and, you know, doing his thing. Um, it can definitely shed light on the contributions that people use who are in the disability population, not telling you what to do on your, um, no, 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 no. <laughs> but I, I, I got to get a closer view of that, of uh, the hat, the your logo. Can you see it? I don't know if you can still see me. I'm, I'm messaging with Patrice right now. That's all right. Uh, Keep messaging. We're gonna get. The, we'll figure it out. So I'll okay. go so you can see. So this oh, there is. You go. I like that. I'll get you a hat. I'll get you and Patrice a hat and Isaiah. Yeah, I like so, that. That's our logo. It's the globe because, we're, you know, worldwide and and, and so world. you you said you was up in the, you were up in this area. You yeah. you said yeah we have a, and a, and Blaze is where Blaze Sports is where the national organization. We're actually the advisory committee to the nineteen and the, uh, what they call the parent the to the 1996 uh, Paralympics. Um, mm -hmm on the advisory committee to the Paralympics as well. So um, Blaze Sports America is an orga national organization. Um, spearheaded the headquarters is in Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and we have the largest, like I said, wheelchair basketball tournament in the state of Georgia um, that's held here. Uh, with I, went, I forgot how many teams that we, we had last year, but it was hundreds of people. We had a team from New York that came down, Washington State. Um, so it's a really great, uh, you know, great organization. Um, it's a really great organization, adaptive basketball, adaptive, uh, swimming. Uh, we have a lot of programs for veterans, so it's a really great organization. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure Isaiah would probably be interested in, in, in We would that. love to have him down. We would love, love to have him to be a part of <laughs> yeah, get rolling. I mean, he got, his, he got his little book. I mean, he's doing his. Um, he teaches. Well, he trains his able-bodied young men and young men and women in terms of basketball, right now. Okay. Yeah, and working for the uh, recreation department in Mount Vernon at some of the schools. That's amazing. 
and trying to finish school also. Okay. Kind of happen. It's gonna happen with all those jobs, like <laughs> all the titles. Like uh, you know, he sounds like he's a very uh, determined young man for sure. Well, yeah, he's always been like that, though. He's always been determined and right? always been focused. You know, again, it's just opportunity. You know, he almost, he almost, almost, he was somebody recommended him for a b able body. Um, basketball coach as a j as a jv coach at one of the i think it was iona prep or something like that he mm -hmm. he was up for it um he, yeah he's very knowledgeable and but just the just the mere fact that somebody recognized him you know mm -hmm. for the work he did in aau and the things that he does in some of some of basketball programs uh during the summer that they would recognize his intelligence his ability to to uh coach kids and mm -hmm. to and to work with them uh, I love it because with Isaiah, I love it um, because, uh, you know, kind of remind me some of the things that Dion Sanders was talking about that y'all think is about football. Right. He says, I, th I think this is about building men. Mm, right. That's... And I, th I, I think that Isaiah, is, that's his, he's been saying that for years, you know, to him is basketball is just a tool. Right. right? And he's trying to help develop young men. He's trying to help them prepare to go to school, get better at school, graduate from school. So um, that's his that's his mindset. Mm. Well, that's amazing. That that's really amazing. And he's definitely more than inspiring. He is a like he's changing people's lives. Um, I have I know a couple of coaches. Um, De Dequel Robinson is one of them. He coaches able body track. And he's a wheelchair user. He's a gold medalist as well. Um, and at the, like I said, at the, at the beginning of it all, um, things like, okay, I see someone said this is uh, Alice Nash National Autism Speaks Month. Okay, that's true. Um, that's something else that's going on as well. But his experience and all of the things that he's overcome is invaluable you know you think about it when people are applying for jobs a lot of times like it's at least in my industry in my space you want the person who has the most experience because they right. can take all of their experiences all of their uh challenges and things that they've learned and pass them along and help to accelerate any team any team can benefit i can even see him like doing some public speaking and motivational speaking i haven't even met him yet but he's <laughs> <laughs> And man, you know, because uh, if you're coaching, you have to be able to motivate someone and they have to trust you. And that that trust is innate. Like you have to be able to pass that on and they can physically see. Just imagine if he had to convince them otherwise, you know, they can physically see his talent. Right. So some, and that's something that that's an advantage that he has over anyone else. Like that's not that's that's something that you can visibly see. So the fact that he is, has been able to um, overcome and to coach and to inspire um, and to build great character in these individuals that are that he that are that he's training us that's incredible. Yeah, no, it's awesome. I'm I'm very proud of him. Um, and I don't even know if he's home. Let me see where my my wife is with. See, I know she's working diligently up there. I apologize. I I will. <laughs> he, is, he, he is not home yet. I did try to find him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. How how they go with the video? Um, no, it, she sent it to Google Drive, but it, it sends a, um, it sends a, a request for uh, ac access to your Google Drive. So you have to go to your Google Drive and say yes to me so that I can have access to it. I'll make sure that we get something to you guys. Yeah. I have the tech person at 20 for the emphasis that I am. And for what it may be because I'm on the mobile app that it doesn't give me the same access no. as it would. We're gonna we're gonna do a we're gonna do a part two. So we just need to figure out a good a, another date and do it. But I, I do want to say thank you. Um I'm excited, you know, uh you know about this and you know, I hope hopefully that you know, those listening and those who will listen because 
Uh, we stay on Lowe's Mortar Blueprint on Facebook and on YouTube. It just stays on there. And so a lot of people, even though we are on here tonight, a lot of people, it will show up later. People will come later. They, oh, I didn't make it tonight on Sunday. And they'll come and watch it again. And uh, one of our city city council members was on earlier uh, listening and making comments as well. So, yeah, that that's that's all exciting. Awareness is the key. It is. It is. And thank you all both for the opportunity. Uh, I love the, the blueprint. You have a new fan. And, <laughs> you know, in our community of individuals, of course, we will be sharing the information on there uh, as well. So we are incredibly grateful to be here uh, on behalf of me and my, my team. Uh, I couldn't do what I did without having uh, support. So I appreciate you for your platform and our amazing team with Will Destrian and our yes. advocates. Sure. So again, thank you. Just hold on a second and uh, I'm going to close out. Um, so uh, again, I want to say thank you out there to the audience uh, for your support each and every week of the Blueprint. Uh, remember that I love you guys, man, and I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. And as I say each and every week, uh, if God allows you to wake up tomorrow, make tomorrow your masterpiece. I'll see you next week. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Lowe's More, the Blueprint Podcast. Stay connected and follow us at our website, www.lowesmore.com. That's L-O-W-E-S-M-O-O-R-E.com. You can also join the discussion on Twitter at Lowe's Moore and on Facebook at Lowe's Moore Jr. As always, thank you for pushing your mindset towards a better reality. This concludes the most thought-provoking portion of your day. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this podcast to stay fully up to date with everything we're up to. Until next time, be kind to yourself and each other. With the kitchen is a joke, I ain't buying it like I'm broke. Insufficient funds for insignificant